Hello guys, welcome to yet another education talk. Uh, today I have a very exciting guest who is the founding director of the MS in Sustainable Design Program at Thomas Jefferson University and also a director of education at the AIA Philadelphia. Robert Fleming, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to it. His educational work seeks to train the next generation of sustainability leaders. He works to transform higher education for more value and more impact. He is building a new platform to deliver cutting edge knowledge and concepts to the diverse audience. So his latest book, Sustainable Design for the Built Environment, marks the transition of design from a speciality service to the mainstream approach for creating a healthy and resilient built environment. I invited Rob today, not only because he's actually a revolutionary uh, with his viewpoints on design education and sustainable future, but also his university program, which he actually runs, went fully online in 2012, making him a pioneer of like, educating future architecture leaders. So I'm very excited to have Rob on the talk with me today. Uh, Rob, let's just roll to the first question. Um, I know that there is a lot of confusion as to what sustainability actually means in our industry. We've been using and overusing that word so many times. And I think that since we are gonna be talking about your solutions for the sustainable uh, architecture and environment, I wanted for us to kind of start with a definition that can be well understood by all our listeners. Yeah, and uh, Sarah, thanks for having me on. And I'm really always shocked at the fact that architects don't want to use the term sustainability. They say, well, the term is overused, doesn't mean anything anymore. But the truth is that architects haven't delved deep enough into what's happening in the larger world of sustainability to know that there are commonly accepted definitions and understandings of what is sustainability in the world. So it's only really in our industry and a few others where this concept actually hasn't permeated yet. So for example, if you were to go to the United Nations, you would see something like the Brundtland Commission in 1987 developed a very simple definition of sustainable development, meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That is a, a very not definable statement, but a very important statement. It's the equivalent of like a declaration of independence for a country. That's how powerful that statement is. And embedded in that statement is the idea that we have empathy for future generations that we actually can make decisions now that benefit others in the future, we're paying it forward. So there is a, a fine line between the definition of sustainability and the definition of sustainable development. And I think that's where part of the problem is, Sarah, is that people haven't really delved deeply into that. So typically for sustainability, we talk about the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line is widely accepted in most governments, not the US, and also widely accepted at all Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 corporations. Triple bottom line in its most simple form are, is people, planet, and profit. Now, I know that sounds really basic, Sarah, but I think, again, we need to understand what does that mean for architecture? So people, what if we really thought about social equity in every decision that we made when we design a building? Profit, what is the economic viability of the decisions we're making? Are we designing buildings that are too expensive to be built? I can tell you that in design school, we are. And then of course, planet. Can we make decisions that will get us to a net zero carbon future, to a regenerative future? So those are three of the triple bottom lines for sustainability for us architects. We had a fourth bottom line of place. So people, profit, planet, and place. And the idea there is that we're going to make meaningful spaces and places that people really love and cherish and renovate for generations of generations. I go to cities in Europe, and people go to these piazzas and they're like, this is the most amazing things. Those piazzas are not going to go away. They have intrinsic value. So those buildings are gonna last for thousands of years instead of hundreds of years. Or in the US, we make buildings for tens of years. So those four really are the way that sustainable designers define the built environment and, and how we think about architecture. And the fact that architects in general have not yet delved, delved deep, dove, have not looked deep enough to even get to that, to say that sustainability is not understood or overused is really actually kind of, I hate to say it, irresponsible and shows a lack of effort on our part as an industry. Yeah, and actually when I listen to your definition of sustainability, I think that it really opposes this kind of very ambitious notion to kind of remove yourself as a creator of architecture from the picture and really start prioritizing other 
things um, above your willingness or want to actually create something that could be memorable or make an impact in Desi Magazine or Art Daily. Um, because I think that, I mean, I don't want to question the motives of architects, but I think that our industry is so very much like, kind of um, like dominated by trends that a lot of times we do actually build not sustainably and too expensively because of fitting into that trendiness. Um, so it's really interesting that within your department of architecture uh, at the university, you teach a new generation of students who actually think differently about the environment. Yeah, and, and we're excited about that. Exactly. So actually that takes me to another question. You developed a, um, a fully digital course out of your, your teaching in 2012. What was the motive behind that? Why did you decide to go that way specifically, <sighs> especially that in 2012, uh, I mean, digital transformation and teaching online wasn't really that much of a thing. I mean, there were MOOCs for sure, uh, but actually at the time they were quite, they were failing. So I wonder what really kind of, <laughs> what really motivated you to bring that, um, you know, on the university level? Well, Sarah, unfortunately for me, I have my own guiding principle of trying to change the world and make the world a better place. And I know that sounds really corny and and the truth is for me is that I wanna get the message of sustainability out to as many people as quickly as I can, as well as I can. So back in 2012, I was like, we gotta get online. We've gotta get this out to the world so that people can take this information in and make their own decisions about how they wanna change their practice or not. And um, you know, we, we did MOOCs, we did online courses and we expanded the reach of what we were teaching. And, and then the second part is, and I, I didn't really think about this, I'll be honest, the social equity of it is actually pretty amazing. So we're able to connect to people who wouldn't normally be able to go to graduate school, uh, a single parent, a person who's working, a person who has less dollars. You know, how can we get this so it's accessible to folks? Knowledge should be free. We know that it can't be free all the time, that we have to pay our bills, but we want to make sure that we can get this out there so that people can start to make their own changes. So that, that was another driver. And the last one is, um, I don't like to be on the, the edge where I'm reacting. I like to be proactive. I didn't want some dean to come to me someday and say, you need to take your class online. I wanted to be the leader in online so that I could define the terms and also make the mistakes by which would make me really good at teaching online. And I think now, almost eight years later, I think we have a really strong online program. We've learned how to do that. And furthermore, last point, Sarah, is that teaching online actually made me a better campus teacher. It forced me to organize all my materials, forced me to develop learning objectives, and to really actually reimagine the design studio itself. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Yes, I'm already burning to ask this question, really. You mentioned mistakes and lessons learned. And I think that a lot of people today, post-COVID, that have already been teaching online for the last three months, uh, perhaps are toying with an idea of actually implementing parts of the faculty um, online and keeping that model towards uh, the future. Uh, but just so that people don't make the same mistakes that you guys have come about, um, what are the main mistakes that you felt, um, you know, you discovered and also how did you go about them and what solutions? Yeah, so we bought into the concept of the hype that asynchronous learning would be good. And the, the idea is that the students would learn on their own pace. We would develop the materials and we would be there maybe as a coach now and then. But generally, the students were moving through a set of predetermined materials, videos, text, etc. Uh, we experimented with that for two years and we did not like it. And we didn't like it, uh, I was willing to do it. It wasn't about me and my own experience as a teacher. That was not one of the drivers. I, after doing assessment, and that's another thing we'll talk about a little bit, after assessing the learning, uh, we weren't happy with the results. We weren't happy with what the students were learning, the amount of stuff they were learning. And so we ended up moving to what is called a semi-synchronous model where we do live, lectures every week, we do record them. So if a student can't react or be there for the live, they still have access to it. So we call it semi-synchronous because there is these, the, the materials are all there for the students to take it in, but then these, these really dynamic lectures are in there every week and, and that really enlivens the curriculum and makes it real. Um, and we found that to be really wildly successful and we've done assessments since then 
comparing, say, asynchronous versus semi-synchronous versus synchronous, and we found the semi-synchronous uh, was the ultimate for most level of achievement of the students. Interesting. And would you explain a little bit the the wording? What does asynchronous and semi-synchronous and synchronous means? It's a cool word, but um, yes. you know, I think that uh, it can be a new word for a lot of people that just are moving yeah. into the world of online education. Yeah, so let's let's work it backwards. We'll start with synchronous. I think synchronous is what most professors are used to. You go and you do a live lecture and the students ask you questions in real time. And there's so many wonderful benefits to synchronous, the eye contact, the, the interaction, right? The, the sense that they're learning, you can see the reactions on their face. Uh, and so, but but I do want to say, Sarah, that there there is sort of a, a, a elevation of synchronous as being the best, and we found that not to be true. Uh, many of my colleagues accused online lectures as being boring. I was like, wow, that's really a harsh statement. I wonder if that's true. And then I happened to be walking down the hallway one day past one of the classrooms where one of these people were teaching and all their students were asleep in the back of the classroom in a live lecture. So I started to really, this is again going back to like, well, what are we really doing? Like, is a live lecture really as good as people think it is? So synchronous was one thing, right? And we can do synchronous online. Zoom and other platforms have made that really possible. Um, but again, the social equity, the idea that students are working, the idea that students learn at different paces, the idea of a semi-synchronous model was that we would record these lectures, these live lectures, rather than having pre-recorded lectures, which I'll talk about in a minute. And those live recorded lectures are like when you buy an album from a band and you hear the clapping and the sounds in the background, it has a, a lot better uh, sensibility. And then of course, to go to asynchronous, which is where the student is really on their own, they're going through these materials, all the videos are pre-recorded. And I don't know, Sarah, if you've tried to make your own pre-recorded videos, they're very difficult to make. They tend to be rather dry and they tend to be not very, uh, they're not exciting. And so what we found was that we do have all of those and they do exist, but we, we, we abandoned the asynchronous model and, and really went to the semi-synchronous model. And that makes complete sense. I feel that um, to be really good in front of a camera and do it asynchronously, um, you kind of need to always think that the camera is the person that would also be reacting to what you say. So you need to be in that mind space to be able to interact with something that's imaginary. Um, but without that interaction, it really does fall dry and fall short of emotions. Um, however, uh, you know, there is also ways in which you can kind of combine it. So uh, I think in the past we discussed already uh, topics of, for example, um, re pre-recording parts of material that you're on site on where, or where you are actually uh, teaching something that the students may not necessarily have access to. And you can put that together into a pre-recorded material and show it later. Uh, how to videos are really good for it because they kind of follow one structure, one methodology. Um, and I find in the industry that that is, does actually work. Uh, but interestingly enough, right now I'm putting together a webinar, like I mentioned before, and actually parts of it, um, it's quite hard to test before you see the reaction of people because there's like, you still need to keep an interaction going, but in the same time, like, you don't want to say something that is prompting interaction. Like, do you guys agree with me? And if someone doesn't say anything, that's so weird. So like you will be kind of setting yourself up for failure down the line when you play that webinar to people. Uh, so yeah, there is this, obviously that awkwardness. And I think that the model of working with the recording in the synchronous, uh, on the synchronous level, and then having that on the replay so that people can go back to it is, is working really well. So it's great that you guys discovered it. And, you know, going down this route, I wanted to ask you, um, what was the things that you decided to completely abandon and which things you kind of evolved around as you were developing the models of education online? Yeah, so a couple things there. One, I, I, I did want to mention that the how-to videos are actually pretty valuable. That's different than a pre-recorded lecture. So when you're teaching software or design methodology, the how-to videos are actually really powerful. I must have made 60 to 80 videos. So how do you orient a building, Sarah? What if I actually did it and drew it and explained my thinking while I was orienting a building? So the students could see the professor doing all the assignments. So this is a radical departure from the old studio model where, where the students discovered how to design a building. You send them off, they design, you, they come back and you tell them how they did it wrong and they go and redo it. 
Um, that's a very slow methodology. It's a very effective methodology, by the way. I'm not against the discovery method. But when we started to go online and when we started to teach students that were working, there's not enough time to have the luxury of discovery learning. That takes hours and hours of studio time. And so we had to invent a new model where the students could still learn how to design, but not through a discovery method. So we realized that we had to make how-to videos. How do you orient a building? How do you lay out a building? How do you integrate a building into a site? How do you develop a wall section? How do you figure out daylighting? How do you figure out energy modeling? And we decided to make tutorial videos uh, for every step along the way. And let me tell you, Sarah, this has been transformational. The students get stuck at midnight. They're trying to do X project and they're stuck. They can go to video number 417 that covers a particular topic, like how do you put solar panels on a roof of a building? How do you calculate? And they now have this other kind of wealth of knowledge that they can draw upon that they didn't have before. Before they would work with their, their students in studio or they have to wait to talk to the professor. And that, that, that is now transforming my campus studio where I still use a little bit of discovery learning, but at this point, Sarah, with climate change, and I don't think we have the time for the, or luxury for discovery-based studio model teaching anymore. We have to find new models. There needs to be more urgency in what we're doing. And I don't see that urgency right now. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because actually when I go back in memory to my uh, student days, we didn't have anything like that. The time that we had to share with our mentors was limited. And normally you focused on per project basis. A lot of it was design questions. And when you were designing and you didn't know how to do something like detail drawing or whatever, you had to search it yourself. Um, and I think that then you're exposed to a lot of, um, to the world of things you don't understand, you know, let's just say that it's the first time you're actually drawing a detail of how to attach that solar panel to a roof and you don't actually understand how it works. You'll find some drawing on the, online that you think is accurate, but it's not. And you don't really understand what you're drawing, just draw because you saw it like that on detail. And um, I think it doesn't really give you the depth of understanding of, of how things really work. And with that, you go into practice. So there's always time to learn certain things, but it's so interesting that, you know, when you put a library of how to courses online, not only you spend more time, not physically, but you actually do spend more time with the student because they can, you know, always go back to this yeah. 400 videos or so and see sure. you explain that, um, which kind of in a weird way helps develop that relationship and trust but also um, you are there for their needs. And if they do have that little peculiar need as they're developing a course or, or, or a project or whatever, and they have a question, um, the ability to be able to just log in there and find the answer, I think is priceless. And I think it really is kind of a step to a different type of learning, a learning that is a little bit more focused on quality, not quantity. It's not about the amount of time per se you spend with your student, but how you show up. So a lot of things can just be answered on automation, like all these videos provide that. But then when you do actually show up for coaching sessions, you're there to only solve their problems and kind of answer questions. Um, so actually that leads me to a question that, uh, that relates to studio culture and you know that very much the culture alone is very much built on relationships and on these kind of moments aha moments that happen within the studio where where the learning happens uh, how did you find that transition and and evolve around over time when you did teach online yeah sarah the 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 discussion around studio culture is really becoming quite interesting i i'm sure you're aware of what's going on in the u.s right now and there's a, a very large social equity movement. And uh, it's causing architecture professors to look at studio culture, this sort of invisible requirement to stay in studio 24 hours a day as if somehow that is the, you know, the cult of architecture. And I, I'm wondering now if that really is the, the 21st century model of education. You know, that's, that's an older master apprentice model where the master would come in, interact with the apprentices and then leave and then come back. And I think that model worked for many, for many years, but I don't think looking at, say, for example, social equity, if I'm a student who works, if I'm a student taking care of a parent, if I'm a student who is, lives far away, um, is it really realistic to think that they're going to be in the studio 24 hours a day? And, and I think that expectation has really done a lot of damage to students' um, self-esteem if they're not able to be with the other students, you know, the mainstream students that have the privilege 
and power to be in the studio 24 hours a day. Not everybody has that. So I think on the one level, just looking at studio culture from a social equity point of view. Secondly, the way that final juries are delivered. Um, we immediately removed final juries from our work. They didn't work online, and when we examined them as a power move, you know, basically four, I hate to say it, four old white guys lined up, and you're the student up there, and the student's sleeping in the back, not a great educational model, and really a power model. Um, and so we realized that we had to make a democratic way for students to receive information about their project and receive feedback. And, and furthermore, Sarah, on these design juries, it's arbitrary. Uh, the folks come in, if they had a bad day at work, they take it out on the students. If they had a great day at work, they, they love the students. So the feedback that the students are getting is not consistent and it's not predictable. And there's where the fear comes in. And there's so much fear around architecture education right now. Will I succeed at the final review? Not am I designing a good building. Not am I helping the world become a better place. Not am I fighting against climate change, but will the professors trash me at the final review? And if that is a motivation for doing more work, that is not sustainable. Because we take that into the industry and we become hyper competitive in the industry. And right now we know that we have to start collaborating. We have to share our information. Sarah, if you have a lot of information on the living building challenge that you've developed, you need to share that with other architects. You don't really wanna be in a competitive model anymore. So what we're trying to do is build empathy into the design studio so that students are seen as individual unique students and each having their own path. We don't have any more a culture that they have to fit into. We, we actually massage our culture to reflect the students that we have in that current year. So for example, right now we have a lot of students from other countries that have come in from radically different training that they might have got in the US. Rather than forcing them into the US model, we look at what how they learn and was like, well, what makes sense for them? How can we get them elevated to the next level? And we as professors set the tone and change the curriculum not force the students into our curriculum. And again, all of that really, a lot of it came from online and the innovation that we did online and realizing that, huh, these old models that used to be very good actually aren't really as relevant and could be very damaging to our, to our future architects in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And actually this week alone, I was writing a piece on the topic of competition versus collaboration. I think that just like you said, and, and I just want to kind of expand on it, what I see in the industry happen is that we almost kind of taught to behave that way. So at school, we are competing against each other and actually kind of fighting for our own image at those crits. And then yep. as we graduate, even though you might get your BA, MA, PhD, even if you did it all in a row, you're still not good enough for practice until you do an internship, which brings you down to the entry level and kind of forces you to, again, compete for, you know, your status or whatever it is until the moment when you start a business and there to inquire clients or actually start doing more interesting projects, you need to enter competitions, which is like the most popular way for architects to actually land projects is to constantly enter competitions. And a lot of it is under, like not paid at all. You need to invest the time of actually paying for your staff or your, your crew to do the design of the competition until you enter it. And you're kind of waiting, are you gonna win or not? If not, then that was just wasted time and a nice, you know, a one of design <laughs> that I don't know where it even goes. And um, yeah, like it's, it's just crazy what's happening in the industry. And I think that we very much kind of moved away from it mentally, but unfortunately the system is still there and it still opposes so much stress because if you think about yes. how those things work, it's not just that you have to show up for that crit and that's the stress point. No, you're not, most of the time you're doing it after five days of not sleeping. Right. <laughs> and like right. same happens for competitions when you are an adult already or how you run into deadlines and all that stuff. So I think all in all this, the system of how architecture is taught and practiced um, is kind of, yeah, it's setting us up for failure in a way, I, I dare to say. And and I think that it's not our fault, but we need to wake up from it and kind of realize what's happening to us. And is this something that we want to agree to, you know? And so this is where those innovative models start to kind of surface right now, especially with pandemic that had also showed the fragility of our industry. Um, I'm hoping that people will, uh, you know, keep more or like keep growing into new alternative ways of doing business and also concepts of collaboration. 
Uh, I actually wonder, I wanted to ask you on your opinion about where the industry is going post COVID. I have tried to recently um, actually uh, tap into some statistics. I wasn't like, super successful with it, but I was interested to, well, I, I am actually interested to know how is it all going statistically? Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to tell me that, but I just wanted to see your um, your feelings about you know the industry, the industry of education as well. Uh, I mean, you're you're a director at the AIA, so I'm sure you have a lot of um, you know impression of it and how things have changed post COVID. Yeah, and I, I guess I'd start by just saying that I do think that architects in general are pretty amazing people. I mean, this is not when I'm, I'm giving you a lot of negativity about the process and the system. I think that architects themselves generally are brilliant people who are very synthetic and can actually bring in a lot. What's happened though, Sarah, and I told you about the quadruple bottom line, the economic viability um, of the architectural idea is just bad. I mean, we have put ourselves in a corner and made ourselves so vulnerable to the rest of society because we can't handle the economics of the decisions that we make. And I do go back to design school and I think that at the foundation of this problem is that architects are taught without budget. Um, I'm not saying that the architects should design to budget or a budget, I'm saying that budget has to be part of the thinking. And what's happened over the last 25 years or 30 years, I, I think it's the same in Europe, the construction manager has really risen up as the first contact of the client. So that we as architects who used to be the partner of the client now have lost our standing as the leaders. And we lost that standing because we couldn't handle a spreadsheet, because we couldn't make decisions that were financially viable in the early stages of design. I mean, that's really a failure on all levels. And yes, I am a, a board member at AIA, um, and I am in the AIA because I would rather be part of that system to change it rather than sit on the outside and say these things. And, and I do see, by the way, I don't know what it's like in your country, but even in all of the, like the AIA in America, there's a lot of things changing very quickly. There's new people coming in, there's younger people coming in. And I think that the, the idea of the old white architect with gray hair is sort of going away and these young folks are coming in and really transforming it. I wanted to be a part of that, so I signed up. Um, so I think that, that now you look post COVID and you, you think whenever the economy is really tough, architects suffer. Um, unfortunately, we're seen sometimes as a luxury and not a necessity. And so one of the reasons that I'm so excited about sustainable design, and I think it is a, it is a avenue by which architects can regain some of their relevance in the 21st century, that like doctors who are healing patients, we as architects and built environment professionals are healing the environment. And we know that healthcare happens at multiple scales. And so we need to change our story we need to, to repaint what our role is in society so that clients see us as a viable team member and not as just a person to help us get a cool building. And that is a vehicle that could really transform us. Right now though, to answer your question, we're gonna have a tough time over the next five to 10 years. It's going to take a while. When we had the crash in 2008, it took five years for our industry to come back. And now we're looking at the same five years now, and, and who knows, things could even be different. I mean, I just don't know how things are gonna shake out. Yeah, I think nobody knows, but it's true that um, COVID has really showed us how vulnerable the industry altogether is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming back to the topic of how, you know, you feel sustainability is so important. Um, I know that you developed a really interesting design model that you teach as well as you shared in your book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So would you be able to tell us a little bit about it? I, I love it and I would love to also promote it and share it. So, um, <laughs> so, well, uh, uh, so I yeah, want to ask Sarah. you to explain to us really what, what is it, this model and, uh, and what sure, benefits sure. does it bring? Sure. So um, one of the reasons that I write books, Sarah, is to force me to innovate. There's nothing more pressing than a publisher's contract. So I collaborated with uh, Sharon Jaffe, Mark Carlin, and Sigmund Roberts on a book called Sustainable Design Basics. And in that book, we decided to reimagine the design studio process to help students get to net zero. What we found is, Sarah, and I know you've seen this in all of your stories, architects design a building that they like, and then they cram in all this sustainability at the last minute. They put solar panels on, a green roof on, or both, and then they, they, they tint the glass. They don't want to put shading on, by the way, because that would ruin the aesthetic. 
uh, sorry for the sarcasm there. But the point there was, I was like, oh my God, the, the design process itself does not lend itself to net zero energy projects. This is, does not mean that the current design methodology is bad, but it is not well suited to get to net zero. So what if, Sarah, we said that we're gonna reach net zero first with a simple building design that's not too complex and use that as a platform then to do the normative design work of design resolution. So what we do is we, we take the students through a series of very specific steps that include energy modeling and daylight simulation and other metrics, other evidence-based design ideas that by midterm they have achieved a net zero concept building. And in order to do that, we do not let the students start with the concept. That is, that is the beginning of the end of net zero. Rather, we start with design principles, beliefs. We believe that a net zero project is important. We make that endemic to what the students are thinking in their heads while they're drawing. And by midterm, we have net zero. And then by the end of the semester, all the way through the rest of the semester, they do design, like you typically think about it with desk crits and such. And uh, that methodology has proven to be pretty effective so far. We've only done one iteration. We're gonna be doing it again in the fall with 18 students, and we're actually gonna link up with a couple other universities who wanna try it out. Excellent, that's very in inspiring and also interesting. I'm looking forward to see the results of, of this. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the last questions, I'm not sure if nothing else will pop into my mind, but one thing that I wanted to ask you is, you know, you very much kind of, um, you created this course that is very inclusive, that is uh, thinking really outside even of your local geographic influence. And also you, I know because I read uh, about your course, you're accepting people from different walks of life, not just people that did BA in architecture. So I right. think that all of this is growing a whole new uh, generation of leaders that is a little bit uh, different and slightly less traditional to the normal path and, of architects. That's correct. Um, what are the what are the job of opportunities and kind of the influences of that approach in the industry on the economics and also kind of all together on architecture and the practice as the students move into into practicing and working. Yeah, so Sarah, I, I'll start with an admission. Um, it happened by accident. I did originally imagine this master's program for architects and maybe interior designers and landscape architects, but I forgot to say that on the website. I'd never actually defined who could apply, and I got all these applications from builders and developers and people with an English degree, and I'm like, why are these people applying to this program? And I did a lot of research, and I came across this guy named Herbert Simon, who made this famous statement that says, everyone designs who develops a course of action to make the world better. And I started to think about that as like clients design as well, architects design buildings, but clients have a lot of influence on what the design will be, not just budget, but they, they have a lot to say about it. And, if, and Sarah, if you've ever been through something called value engineering, where the builder changes the design to meet budget, they're designing. They're impacting the design of the building. And so I started to realize that everyone designs on some level. They have all have influence on it. And furthermore, I always heard architects say, well, why don't we train the clients? Why don't we train the clients about what architecture is and then they'll be better clients and we'll get better buildings, which I agree with, by the way. So I said, well, let's do it. Let's bring it in. Let's bring them in. And now we train the clients with the architects at the same time. So clients are drawing buildings and they're not great. Let me tell you but they're learning what an architect will go through. They're building empathy for what design is. And now they have a new appreciation for what the architect can bring. And so what's happened is we have this new model of higher education where we don't really care what your discipline is. We, we're all teaching to make the world better and whatever your discipline is, we're gonna make that work. And so having a builder, having an engineer, by the way, Sarah, is the best, right? Having a HVAC engineer or a civil engineer on the design team in real time is transformational to how architecture is made. Um, and those engineers become more sophisticated in the way they understand design. They see themselves now as part of the design team rather than pitting the architect against the engineer, which is typically what we've seen happen in the past. So this new model is not that new for us now. We're, we're 10 years in. What we've seen, Sarah, is our students go on and do amazing things and all kinds of different things. So some architects go in and work for, say, Gensler and their sustainability directors. 
but others start nonprofits um, where they try to help the built environment become better. So one of our graduates wrote building codes for Philadelphia about white roofs and green roofs. That's design. That's shaping the built environment. I think once architects realize that we don't have a monopoly on the shaping of the environment, we can then open ourselves up to be facilitators and communicators and conveners of how we can reshape our environment to become sustainable. It really is gonna take all of us working across discipline to solve the really wicked climate change problems that we face right now. True, and you know, I just got to say that I applaud the fact that you have such a deep understanding of what really the problems in, this, in the industry are and how we as you know, new, fresh, young architects going into the industry, we can kind of get slightly disappointed as we move in and see the reality of things. And I sure. think that preparing people for it um, sets them up for success so much more. And there are these, these issues that you talk about in the industry. I talk about this over and over again with so many people. And um, really, I just think that um, it's kind of, at first it came as a disappointment to a lot of people that have moved into the industry and only later uh, they started to look for solutions. So it's great to prepare uh, the new generation of architects for it as well. And, uh, and I think that, you know, hopefully we're going to be able to change it somehow. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned being, you know, architects being undervalued, I think a big problem of it is communication and how we communicate our value. Um, but also bottom line being that we are in the competitive market, we compete with one another. And this is exactly why uh, we don't set ourselves apart from one another. If we are all architects and we all communicate that we provide design services, then we are in a big ocean of competition with one another. But at the end of the day, if we think about it, we all have different unique talents. And by communicating that, we can differentiate ourselves and put ourselves forward for those clients that specifically need or look for solutions that are unique and different. Yeah, and Sarah, you'll see websites where we do banks, we do office buildings, we do residential, and we do sustainability. When I see a website like that, I can tell that that firm doesn't understand really even the first parts of what sustainable design really is, because you would never say that if you were really, if you really were encouraging sustainable design in the firm, that would be more of a mission vision statement that would be upfront. It's not something that's on a check sheet of things that we provide, right? That's, that's, a, that's a, what I call a negative differentiator. Right? Why not talk about how sustainable design is intrinsic to the success of your projects? That's, sort of, that's messaging that's a lot more effective. But I've also seen, Sarah, where people write that and they don't do it. I've seen a lot of greenwashing in the architecture world. Um, so as you know, I, I, you probably read that I work um, sometimes at a firm called Revision Architecture. And I work there because everything is sustainability, right? There's, there's not even a question mark of whether we're gonna do a, a sustainable building or not. Like, that's a false question. Is this a sustainable project or not? Is that really the kind of thing that a client that you would say to a client? Every project is sustainable. All of those specifications that we write, those thick books that have all of the details of the project, there the sustainability is in there. We as architects control that book. We can put sustainability into every project, but we have a green spec and a non-green spec. This is really the, the, the sort of ethical and moral failing of our profession that we have not taken the leadership that we could have taken. So for example, like I'm on the AIA, I'm proud of it. And I think we're doing a lot, but you see that there's a group called the United States Green Building Council. Why does that group exist? They filled a vacuum, a lack of leadership that we as, a, as, as an industry were not able to do. So yes, I'm being really hard hitting right now and I hope that my friends won't hate me, but I think we have to have these hard conversations. We have to look at ourselves under a microscope and say, how did we get here? How did, how did this happen and how can we, create a new pathway forward. And that's, you know, just to throw a compliment back at you, I think that's what you're trying to do with these series of talks. I think you're trying to lay the groundwork for a new model of architectural practice in the future that actually can deal with climate change in a real way. Exactly. And at the bottom of my heart, I actually do believe in sustainability. And that's in the first place what brought me to this because I realized that through doing this work, I can also help scale that message. And, you know, I think Today, it's not so necessary anymore to talk about these principles as it was 10 years ago. But I think that utilizing the power of internet and sending a message out there, it really has an impact on the, on the broader audience. And, and, you know, that again, I see as um, 
um, it's an attribute that we can use for everything, education, practice, our personal messages, the way, the way we build our websites and even position ourselves as a firm in the ecosystem of other firms. So all of these things for me are kind of principles of digital transformation and they influence the whole spectrum of things. So, um, so this is pretty much why we're here talking about this because I, I hope that people realize the importance of it, you know, not only your messaging, not only your communication methods, your marketing strategies, um, but also to like really ask yourself, what is the principle of your practice and why are you doing what you're doing? And I would say, Sarah, when you do that, please back it up. Um, I have seen maybe 45 social equity statements in the US. Our firm pledges to XXX. Words are easy, actions are hard. I'd love to see people back it up. If you say that you're gonna do sustainable design, yeah. please actually do it. And, and so that's the sort of the next level. I, I like the words and I'm glad to see people are finding the right words, but the actions have to back it up. And that is really yeah. the next challenge over the next five years is really becoming what I call authentic. Can you yeah. be an authentic architect? Can you state your principles and then back them up with actual action? And that's where it really gets difficult. Sarah, yeah. because it is hard to act in principle. And I will tell you that it's much slower. If you really want to be authentic, it's going to take longer to do stuff. You're going to yeah. talk to more people and you're going to have more roadblocks. But in the end, what did your life stand for? And what yeah. can you say that you accomplished beyond having a beautiful building in a magazine? Yeah. And I think also that uh, we are very much moving into that place where uh, we almost have like an, a radar for authenticity. I mean, there's been so much stuff going on that we kind of gotten sick of altogether because we've seen a lot of people try to sell things, say things that mean nothing. And, right. and, and so this radar is on. And, uh, and I think that um, as we move into more and more into the digital era, it's going to be harder actually to fake it. Online, yeah. it's harder because the more vague words you use the least authentic or um, relevant you seem and yeah. slowly but surely it's going to move to the place where if you just call yourself an architect on LinkedIn uh, sorry but this is going to mean nothing you know like right. it's going to mean nothing you need to say what you stand for you need to say what you're expert in and how you can solve someone else's problem how can you provide value uh, because because yeah otherwise you're just competing with other architects so who are we really drafters you know who are we <laughs> i think that there is a big miscommunication and misunderstanding within our clients people that don't know of architecture um, as to what we represent. So in order to fix it, we need to communicate what we represent better. Yeah, and I think that's another reason that I stepped up and got involved in the AIA. I think the AIA, American Institute of Architects, can play a role in that. I think that's part of the mission. Um, can we do more and better? Absolutely. Um, so that is something that I think we have to do. We just It just has to happen over the next five to 10 years. And this is the time to do it. Everything is in turmoil, right? Not Not for good reasons. But it is, I know a lot of folks there have been re-examining their lives during this period. Those who have the privilege to not be out on the front lines working, right? You're at home a lot, right? And so though that has been, I've noticed that people have really been very reflective. And so I do think potentially this is like a cocoon that new butterflies will come out of and new forms of practice will come out. I actually really do think that. So as much as this is horrible, and it really is horrible, a lot of people have died and lost their jobs, we may end up elevating and jumping to and elevating to an entirely new level, not gradually getting better, but having an evolutionary leap in our practices to a new level. And that could be really transformative. So I'm still optimistic. I'm still hopeful for the future. I do think of a utopian future. I tend to focus on utopia. I think it's too easy to fall into dystopia. And yes, we are on the doorsteps of dystopia. There's no doubt about it. We're seeing it. Um, but I think that if you, you and I and about 14 million other people go towards utopia, we can, we, we can tip the scales, right? We don't need everyone to believe in sustainability. We only need enough leaders to buy in to sort of make the cultural changes that we need. So we are at a worldview shift right now. We're at a moment in history where we can elevate to a new level of thinking about our role on the planet. And we didn't talk about animals and the ecosystems and how we're destroying the planet. Like we didn't even talk about that, but we're also becoming more aware of the fact that the planet is being destroyed by us. So this is an opportunity again to reflect 
It's how can we do this differently? Net zero is net zero energy is a must. How could anyone teach an architecture design studio and not require students to reach net zero? How is that possible that in the 21st century with what we know that we can't figure out how to do that? We can't tweak our design studios to make sure that that happens. That, I mean, come on now. This is, so this is why I'm actually starting to get upset. So I'm gonna stop before <laughs> I start to get really mad. And I'm gonna, cause you know, I'm 23 years in Sarah. I'm having I some know. of the same discussions I had 23 years ago that I'm having today. How is that possible that we have not evolved very much in 23 years? That's a real sad statement about our industry. So I'm yeah, done. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stop because I'm going to get mad. So you, you, so we'll get, we'll go. If you have more questions, I'll answer them, but let's shift. No, the topic thank there. you. Honestly, I think that, um, you know, it was great. I'm really, really glad that we did this. Thank you so much, Rob. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's true. We're talking about these things over and over again, but, yep. but hopefully, someone hears it and even if if it's not a significant group of people sometimes happens things like now with the social equ equity there is just a movement that happens and yeah. i think we see those happen more and more often also on the environmental level uh so hopefully i think that the transitions are happening on so many different levels um and there are so many different other topics that we could talk about um sure. that i don't even want to start uh, but I know that exactly. you and I, we already discussed some of them in the past, like institutionalized <laughs> education and things like that, that, you know, it's, it's just, I think that some changes are a result of, of human consciousness and, and certain awareness rising and, and uh, perhaps we're still at the stage of, of having to realize you know, that we can't continue that way. Uh, but that's also fine for now. So thanks so much for joining me on this talk. Always a pleasure, and we'll be pleasure. in touch, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. It was fun talking to you. Thank you. Take care, Robert. Thank you so much. Bye.